Thanks for that introduction, a vanguard. I'll try to live up to that. <laughs> Good to, well, not see you, because I can't see you, but I saw you before. <laughs> Turn on. Good to see so many of you. Um, so, more and more people are starting to look like this when it comes to medicating the brain and the mind and the emotions and thoughts and the soul, basically, and with good reason. First of all, there are loads of adverse events, side effects to these psychiatric drugs, and they're not very effective over the long term. That's a whole talk on its own, but if you want the most recent data I can find for antidepressants, it's about 15, one five percent of people, patients on antidepressants, who have a response that is larger than the placebo response. And for antipsychotics, it's an astonishing 23% of patients who get a what's categorized as a good response. Now, that's not a lot of people. Right? And of course, it's not a very, well, not of course, but it's not a very fun place to be in a numb mind long term, which most of the psychiatric drugs do. Uh, it may help in the short term, but over the long term, you might not even notice that your mind is numbed and your emotions are numbed in a unhelpful way. Now, of course, the world can also not be a fun place to be long term, but that's a different issue. Hmm. And if it isn't, then it's because something's wrong that we need to pay attention to. And the fact that that's been medicalized and psychiatry has been able, and psychology for that matter, to call that symptoms of diseases is just to me absolutely absurd. Something out of a bad movie, which is just true. But that's another talk. Um, so more and more people are starting to look like this, maybe for some of the reasons I just explained, maybe for some other reasons, but then discover, realize that they can't just come off the drug. So what can happen is that a lot of people get caught between the side effects or the adverse effects of taking the drugs and the withdrawal effects from not taking the drugs. Now that's a trap. And the solution to that is tapering. So th the solution to physiological dependence, as it's called, is tapering or gradual dose reductions. And tapering has turned out to be a science in itself to figure out how to do this. And I really want, also in the spirit of ICI, to have this the other way around. Much of the knowledge we have on how to come off psychiatric drugs comes from the lay person, lay people community. And then we researchers and some others have kind of, I like to think of it as we can confirm what is known in that field instead of making it the other way around. That's what happens now because it's a hot topic. So researchers will write fancy articles saying that we figured this out and that's very provocative in some way to the people who went through it and actually figured it out that way. But it's still important for this to have to, to get attention to do the science. So I started doing that back in uh, uh, 2016. Basically, I discovered that the clients I tried to help come off psychiatric drugs, it was way more difficult than what we had just been taught at university. So the easy, the easy explanation as to why I'm here today is I kind of went with what my patients or clients experienced rather with what was in the books and not in the books. And that journey has got me here and I'm still on it. So, okay. So I'm trying here today to break it down to four <coughs> The, the four basic principles, because it is technical, but it's actually pretty simple too. Psychiatry, if there's one thing they want to, both with drugs and uh, withdrawal symptoms and, and, and mental illness, so they want to make it very complicated, so that it's a science, and so that it makes sense to have experts in it. But actually for this, it is possible to explain it in at least four pretty basic uh, principles. And that's kind of the premise for my talk today. I would like to give you the information as to why and how to taper correctly. And I've tried to do some this funny PowerPoint exercise where you're trying to put it in, you want the lines to be in one line for it not to go down to the next one. So I really tried to give some thought into it, explaining this with as few words as possible. This is what I've come up with. So the four basic principles, like drugs are synthetic, and the brain is homeostatic. Adaptation requires readaptation by gradual receptor unblocking. You could almost find some kind of little melody for that, to remember it. And there are some fancy words here, maybe. Synthetic, homeostatic, adaptation, readaptation, receptor, and that's what I'll try to take you through, because it is actually more, more simple and more straightforward when you understand. It's a matter of understanding a couple of basic principles about the brain, about biology, about how the drugs work, then it kind of all makes sense, hopefully. Um, okay, 
Saturday morning, 10 something a.m., neurobiology class. <laughs> Synthetic is just a fancy word for, well, it, it's the way the drugs are made. It, it means that we made them. They're made up. They might, have, they might affect neurotransmitters in the brain that are naturally occurring, obviously. Serotonin, dopamine, all these different um, neurotransmitters, as they're called, are of course natural, but the drug is not. The drug is synthetic. We made it, and synthesis just means that it's made up in a lab by different compounds. It com it's compounded together by synthesis. That's what it means there. Synthetic, and that goes for all psychiatric drugs. All psychiatric drugs are made to penetrate what's called the, the, the brain, blood brain barrier, which is a barrier that's there from nature's side to protect the brain. But now we've invented things that can penetrate that and then either increase or decrease different neurotransmitters. It is actually more simple than you should know. So the brain is made up of millions of millions of neurons, and that's just a fancy word for brain cells. And they don't touch each other. Well, some of them do, but not all of them touch each other. And inside the neuron, these are two neurons. It's a, an electrical matter, and between them in what's called the synapse, and all these fancy words are not that important, it becomes a chemical matter. So neurotransmitters, And we know some of them, they've almost become daily language, serotonin, dopamine, noadrenaline, adrenaline, histamine, something I'm not going to try to pronounce in English, and GABA. Um, and that's just what the brain cells use to communicate with each other. And all that psychiatric drugs do is different drugs affect different neurotransmitters in different directions. It can go up or down, and it can be different of these, but the basic principle is, is all the same. And the effect of doing this is what we would call a psychoactive effect. And now some people may um, associate psychoactive with what drugs drugs do and psychedelics and stuff, but it's a very, very broad term, like coffee is psychoactive. It's a very broad definition. Anything that we, when we take it in, has an effect on how we feel, thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations, consciousness, is a psychoactive drug. And psychiatric drugs, belong to that overall category of psychoactive drugs. So psychiatric psychopharmacology is really simple, actually, in that way. I have a chapter, and I'm, I'm writing a book about this now, I have a chapter w where, the, where the headline is just psychopharmacology is simple. And all the psychiatric reviewers, when you write a book, you have reviewers. They all commented on that, saying it's not simple, it's way more complicated, yada, yada really want it to be very complicated. In terms of the psychoactive effects, it's actually pretty simple. The psychiatric drug will have a psychoactive effect on your thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations, consciousness that may or may not be helpful. And only the person in the distress obviously can tell that. It's not because there is any chemical imbalance there. And not that we're going to talk about this no being a chemical imbalance, but it's important to know because that's the second principle. Homeostasis is page one in the biology book. It's like a, a fundamental principle governing biological systems, meaning that it seeks, it strives for balance. So when we affect the brain chemistry, when there's no um, um, biochemical imbalance, the body will fight back. It will compensate, it will adapt. It's just as impossible for the brain to not adapt to the psychiatric drug as it is for you to go out in the heat and decide not to sweat. It's automatic, it's out of our control. So it's this kind of fundamental problem that underlies all long-term psychiatric drug treatment. It is that eventually the brain will adapt. And that's an example of what is called homeostasis. It's defined as the body's or a system's ability to maintain stability when it's disturbed. Perturbed. So what we need to understand is that the drugs don't fix anything, they actually cause differences in the brain chemistry, which we then feel as a psychoactive effect. Hope this makes sense. It's important to understand that because then homeostasis kicks in, and homeostasis here, in terms of psychiatric drugs, I've tried to show, I'm gonna, so just to be absolutely sure, these neurons talk together, and the neuron on the left sends a signal to the one on the right, which it then receives and that's how the brain communicates with itself. And psychiatric drugs have an effect on these neurotransmitters. So 
Away with all this, let's take SSRIs for an example, and it's even in the name, SSRI, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. So imagine, and you could use this example with any psychiatric drug because it would just be different, uh, different neurotransmitters that change in different directions, but the principle is always the same. Let's go through it. We might go through it a couple of times. No chemical imbalance here. Everything is as it should be. Brain comes in with the red dots. That's the SSRI idea. For those who want to know it, this is called the serotonin transporter. That's what the drug is manufactured and created to seek out in the body and block. It gets a bit technical because the serotonin transporter is something that reuptakes serotonin. So when you block something that reuptakes something, the amounts increase. Now that's just the detail, that's not that important to know. What's important to know is that when you take the drug, you increase levels of serotonin and all, all other sorts of, of neurotransmitters because it's not selective, but for the purposes of the ex example, just keep it to that. Okay, this is short-term treatment. Now you've elevated the levels of something. Homeostasis kicks in, it makes what's called a downregulation. So it's like saying, you're turning up the volume, I'm just putting in earplugs or something. I'm maintaining the balance because here there was now too much serotonin. The body can't have that. It's fundamentally built to counter that. So it does that with the... It makes itself less sensitive to whatever we've increased the amounts of. And for psychiatric drugs that works the other way around, most antipsychotics, for example, they would block dopamine, then the brain starts either building more receptors to rebuild the sensitivity, or it starts spreading out more dopamine. So the body would always try to adapt. No matter which direction we try to have an effect on it, it will adapt. So that's long-term treatment, however long that is. We don't really know what's the difference, like the duration between short and long-term treatment. Obviously, it's individual. You don't get dependent overnight but it can happen within weeks, months, years. Okay, then we try to imagine stopping the drop cold turkey or tapering too fast. That means that these red dots are gonna remove, obviously, because that's the drug, that's the unblocking. And then the brain starts reuptaking the serotonin, meaning it decreases. And if it was so that the brain just updated its adaptation, its downregulation, it's compensation, there are many words for it. If it just did that overnight, there wouldn't be any problems with withdrawal symptoms, it wouldn't exist. Because this is, as we know it, poor brain, a withdrawal reaction as we know it. Because it's an imbalance. We are now less sensitive to something there that there is also less of. Hope it makes sense. So we go from, just gonna show it again. Drug comes in, increases serotonin. Drug says, body says, nah, -uh, not on my watch. I'm gonna make myself less sensitive to what you just did to me. Stop the drug, and that happens pretty fast. Serotonin levels return to normal, but the brain is stuck, it adapted. It's like a super tanker. It doesn't just change overnight. It can't just stop and walk the other way around as we can do on our legs, it takes time. That's a withdrawal reaction. And just quickly to do on the symptoms and the list on these symptoms, like a lot, obviously you don't get all of the symptoms, um, but these are the, like the evidence-based, there are four literature reviews on this and the symptoms you could get from SSRIs. And I know that this list is on ICI too, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, just to say that obviously some of these symptoms overlap, enter the whole problem. How do we know I've tried to divide it in the physical symptoms here, over here, and the more psychologically e symptoms over here. And I should stress, this is not a list that I made. I just wrote depression and anxiety. It's there from the scientific view. Now, how do we know then, if some of the symptoms are the same, that the drug treats some underlying illness that then resurfaces, or that the drug is just treating the withdrawal state it created itself? So this creates, can create kind of like an illusion of effect, one would say, because if you stop taking the drug, you feel horrible, when you start taking it, you feel good again. It's an illusion of effect, or it can be. 
Um, and that's the whole problem that we are trying to solve with tapering. So back to this one. The next two principles for that poor brain. Now, tapering is all about minimizing this imbalance. There's an imbalance here, so we want the drug to leave the body gradually. And as I said, adaptation took time. It doesn't happen overnight, one, two, three nights. Now, how long it takes, we don't know. For most, it will be already about a couple of months. Um, so readaptation takes time too. Once you reduce your dose or stop the drug, it's the exact same mechanism. The brain is now destabilized and it's trying, it's striving for evening that out. So it's the same principle. It's homeostasis again. The body can't have this. It'll try to fix it. And the whole idea of gradual dose reduction is to give the body this task in small tasks. I'm dividing it up. Because this is too much for the body. It's too great of an imbalance. It's too large for it to, to, to keep up. And that's what we experience as withdrawal symptoms. So we want the body to, we want, sorry, the drug to leave the body gradually. As to minimize this imbalance each time, but also get down and dose. So we proceed with the tapering. Now, And receptor is what the drug is on, and unblocking is just the word for what happens when you reduce the dose. Now, now it becomes a bit more technical, but intuitive too. The body doesn't adapt to the dose, like the milligram. The, millig the dose in milligram is basically just uh, the weight of the active ingredient in the drug, but that doesn't say anything about how much the drug does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't say anything about the biological effect. So <clears throat> in order to know what doses we have to reduce with to minimize this Im imbalance each time, to give the body a task that it can do, that it can repair without um, causing too many withdrawal symptoms, sorry. We need to know the relationship between dose and receptor occupancy, as it's called. Occupancy is the word for, <coughs> excuse me, for what the drug does in the brain. It occupies the receptors, blocks. And this is possible to measure via brain scans. And when that has been done, like giving people different doses, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on, was, and then measuring the effect that has in their brain. And this is the, this is, if you had to, Remember one slide, it's going to be this one, because it looks like this. And some of you may have seen it. Some of you may not. If you haven't, this is crucial. So this is an example, the paper we have out, uh, on sertraline Zoloft. And if I just, in the most simple sentence, say that what we want to decrease gradually is the y-axis, this number over there. That's what the drug does in the brain. And this is the dose. So as you increase the dose, obviously it has a greater effect in the brain, but to an extent, to a certain point, it starts to plateau. There's actually no real difference between, almost no difference between 50 and even 200 milligrams of sertraline because the receptors are already blocked. It's not much difference. And that's important for tapering because when we taper, we go to the left on this curve, hopefully, reducing the dose. The lowest dose of sertraline Zoloft is 50 milligram. And you can have that by the brake line to get down to 25 milligram. But still, you're at a pretty high receptor occupancy. Meaning, if you stop at 50 or even 25, which is the lowest available standard dose, that's, that's not a small drop. It's a huge drop. We just need to understand we get, what's confusing also for doctors and practitioners is that the number seems too low. 25 milligrams seems so low compared to 100 or 200. And some even call it a placebo dose, I've heard. It's such a low dose, you could just stop that. It has no effect. And then withdrawal hell breaks loose. Now the withdrawal community, as far as I know, have known this for a long time. Like it's, it, it's not news in that way, but scientifically it's been new that we tried to, to, to in some way prove this, have some data on it. Um, and it means, the effect of this is that the redu reductions have to be smaller and smaller. 
And that is what is called hyperbolic tapering. Because a small dose reduction in the lower dose range, lower dose range, will have a huge effect on your brain chemistry and thus on withdrawal symptoms. Whereas the same five milligrams, say, up in this range will have either very little or no effect. So the difference between, let's say, zero and five milligram is way bigger than the difference between five and 10. Between 10 and five, it's even less. And that's why when we come off psychiatric drugs, we need to go, first of all, the dose reductions need to be smaller and smaller. Can't keep reducing with the same dose because at some point you will jump over this bend on the curve and that's when withdrawal hits or gets worse. And it means obviously that we have to go lower than the lowest standard available dose, which is where the art part comes into it, right? Um, so, and I can show you just by the numbers, I don't know if I stand, this is, if you just imagine a dose reduction, 150, 175, 50, 25, zero, it looks gradual. But if you translate the dose into what it's doing in the brain and put a percentage on that, then it would look like this. And you can see this is a totally different story. That's not gradual because it's this number that we want to fall gradually. Here it is for effexor, venlafaxine. It's the same. Lowest dose is 37 and a half milligram. And you can see stopping from 37 and a half milligram almost equals cold turkey from a very high dose. This dot, that's a study that measured that. It's a meta-analysis, so each dot is it's a different people. That is 2.4 milligrams. Now, the capsule is about the size of a nail with 37 and a half milligram in it, and 2.4 milligram, that's 1 15th, 1 15th of the smallest dose, also has a pretty high effect. It's incredible. And this is hardcore biological data on that. Meaning that it's not uncommon to go below that dose. We have to come off safely. So if you've tried to come off psychiatric drugs, or if you know someone who's tried to come out, psych out of psychiatric drugs and stopped at the lowest dose or even half of that, or actually even 25% of that, and the withdrawal attempt failed because they got symptomatic, it's because of that wasn't tapering. It wasn't a genuine gradual tapering. It would look like this if you imagined the this is what we would call linear tapering. It's hyperbolic tapering. And you see the issue, 37 and a half to zero, huge difference in the brain. Brain will not accept that. And one last one, Cymbalta, duloxetine. You kind of get the idea right now. All of them look like this. No exception, all of them. We even found this for sunblock. Factor 40 is not double of factor 20. It is in the numbers, but not in terms of what it's, whatever it's doing. I'm not a specialist in that, but it's a, it's a universal principle, it seems. Symbolta. That's five milligram. Almost 50% of the effect in the brain is still left even at that lower dose. And it would look like this. You don't have to look at all these. It's just to say, to show you that it's the same. It's universal principle. And we have a paper out on that. It's a very geeky, technical, boring paper to read. But if you need the data, if you need to present this to someone who doesn't understand, a doctor, say, a clinician, this might be it. Now, the next slide is, is, is supposed to be very annoying. You're not supposed to... to to read all these numbers, but that's just to show you. Obviously, this is reductionistic in some way. The drugs do more. They affect more neurotransmitters than just one. So in reality, you should imagine m many lines being here for sertraline, dopamine, GABA, yada, yada. This is just the one that antidepressants have the largest effect on. That's why we use that as an example. But how it actually looks is this. So 
I can't even see it. Imagine that's all, that's all antipsychotics over there, or many, and then each row is a neurotransmitter in the brain, and then the number represents to what degree it infects that. So it is more complex, but not, complex, not more complex in a way that we necessarily have to understand, because there's no reason to assume that any of these uh, relationships is not hyperbolic. It will be the same. But it's just to show you. There is some complexity behind it, but the governing principle is the same. Okay, so that's how it looks. My office looks very funny sometimes with beads and and syringes. Syringe? Yeah. Obviously, sometimes the brake line works, but this, no, no. No go. The body can detect it. It's incredible. Not incredible. That sounds positive. It's crazy. Can you say that? <laughs> How small dose reductions the body can detect in the lower dose range. Still to this day, even though I know all of this, and I see this every day, I find myself being shocked about it. There's this little thought saying, this can't be true. I almost can't see it. It looks like dust on the table. Or it's two or three beats, but it does have an effect. We need to remind ourselves of that. I'm not going to go too much into the technicalities of how to do it, but obviously we need to go lower than the lowest standard dose. Use the brake line as far as we can go. For drugs which are in capsules, we can open them and count the beats. And for uh, pills, we could either weigh it or dissolve it in water. And there are all sorts of but in this, that is also described very thoroughly on ICI, so I won't, there's a very thorough guide on how to do it and which, which drugs can be tapered in, in what way and not. So I'm not going to go too much into detail about that, but just to show you that this is how it looks to do it. And it's necessary. Absolutely. Okay. Did I forget something? So that was a bit about tapering. I hope it makes sense now why have to do it hyperbolically. What happens in the brain? It has two purposes. First of all, all this brain talk with the fancy words. One of the purposes that I'm doing that is that explains why we need to do it so slowly. But it also gives the explanation of why it's happening. And I've experienced over the years that because Generally, like overall, it's really difficult for us humans to feel the stress without also thinking about why. It's tough even to have a tough day without also this talk going, why? What could I have done? What is this? And obviously the symptoms are tough enough on their own, but if you also have this inner voice going, what is it? If you don't have the explanation, it gets worse. So I've experienced over the years that, you know, knowing the technicalities down to the detail on what happens in the brain actually helps getting through it because you have an explanation that you can hang it on. And then if your thoughts keep saying, what is it, what is it, keeps wanting to analyze what it is, then you have kind of a, an, an argument to that. And hopefully this can help you make these mental discussions with yourself as brief as possible because they can be pretty long and it adds on top of, of withdrawal. Sometimes the psychological layer of distress can be, can be pretty significant. So just reducing that would be <coughs> hopefully helpful. Okay, but the next one is like dose reductions in general. And there really is just one way to go in my opinion. Obviously we know it's a universal thing that it has to be hyperbolic, no doubt about that. Now, what I showed you on the graphs, and this is very important, are the average, it's the mean. So you can't just enter these graphs and say, okay, I'm on that dose, then I have that exact occupancy in my brain, because it varies. So what's very annoying is that we know for a fact that at some point you are going to hit that bend on the curve where the next reduction, even though it was as small as the previous one, gives way worse withdrawal symptoms. We know it's going to come, but we do not know exactly when. Some people may be able to come down to, say, uh, 75 milligrams of Effexor before anything regarded to withdrawal hits. Some may hit it already at 112 and a half. 
very few people, few people, don't experiment with this, may be able to go all the way down to 37 and a half before withdrawal hits. It was very annoying because it's predictable and unpredictable in the same way. We know it'll happen, but we don't know exactly when. And the consequences of, of making a reduction over that bend can be pretty dramatic because you could get very severe and for some people even protracted withdrawal symptoms. So don't experiment. But the idea really is to reduce and stabilize and reduce and stabilize based on the bodily feedback. Be careful with these very strict so-and-so many percentage reductions after so-and-so many weeks. There's no evidence to back them up and it's too strict. Like, it doesn't work like that. The body might need more time, it might need less time. So really take this as an exercise to, which is something that would be useful anyway, to listen and use that feedback. But without over-listening, without self-monitoring all the time, without threat monitoring, without ruminating, without spelling, spending the whole day thinking about how you feel and what that is and what to do about it. Like that's, the, that's the extreme of that. We need to find the balance between those two. And obviously, what does stabilize mean? Now, that's, that's a whole talk to itself, because stabilize doesn't mean the smiley there. It doesn't mean that you're happy and have no symptoms and everything's good, obviously, because you're still on the drug. So you're stabilized to the baseline that there is on the drug at that dose. And that is sometimes very difficult to tell when have I stabilized after a dose reduction. Also because the symptoms tend to come in windows and waves, so they don't just heal, they don't just necessarily heal linearly. Like tomorrow is not always better than today and then on it goes. It can come in, withdrawal symptoms can come in, in waves and that's very important to be f familiar with, with oneself. Um, Usually, usually, if it had to be some rule, I don't like setting up rules, it would be about the 5 to 10% reductions of the previous dose after the plateau. If you're on a very high dose, it's rarely necessary to reduce that small, that small amount to the very high dose. Now, what a very high dose is, I don't know. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to tell because it'll be individual. Uh, but bigger cuts definitely is possible for some people above the plateau, meaning that if you start with 5% reductions from, say, 300 milligrams of Effexor, you'll prolong the tapering unnecessarily because some part of the dose may be pure over-medication. It may have no effect whatsoever on the brain, meaning that it's pretty low-hanging fruit to remove that, but without getting withdrawal. Maybe you even get better because you get less side effects. Um, but where that is, again, we don't know. That's what's so annoying about it. We can't tell for any given individual at what dose the occupancy curve will bend. Okay, and free crew micro tapering is something that I've, and micro tapering is just the word for like making extremely small reductions, 1% even, and then obviously making them more frequent. It doesn't, you don't have to wait as long if you make a very small reduction obviously, because it's a smaller task for the body. So we need to align those two. And for some people, especially in the end, will sometimes go like 0 0.1 milligram or even less, but then doing it more frequent. And for some people, they actually succeed because that's a smooth tapering. The body never gets the, the big cut. And for some people, that actually can go faster. Like, instead of reducing, getting symptoms and stabilizing for whatever how, how long that takes, time, then spreading many n numerous reductions out in the same time, sometimes that can work, giving less withdrawal symptoms, but it's, a, it's an individual <coughs> thing, obviously. And the exact exit dose is very difficult to predict, that's the big question. When then can I stop? Obviously that's also individual, but I'll say one thing. Keep reducing, if you keep reducing by 10%, for example, of the previous dose, like mathematically, you will never come off. There will always be a 100% reduction in the end. Always. And it's an individual thing, obviously, to, to figure out when that is. Um, but just to say that, with all respect of how slow tapering has to go and the curves and everything, there is a place to stop too, where you risk prolonging it unnecessarily by 0. 0.000 something. always be 100% reduction. Managing withdrawal symptoms. Now that's the next thing. 
for some people with correct hyperbolic tapering, it's definitely possible to avoid withdrawal symptoms completely. It takes time, it could take years, but it's definitely possible. For most, it's more a matter, a question of reducing it, like minimizing the symptoms to a level that is tolerable. So for most people, I would say, we can't avoid it completely. So there is an aspect of, okay, then how do we go through it? And that's a talk on its own, obviously, because it's a big thing. But one thing, and this is the psychologist in me speaking, I like figuring out how psychotherapy and how the tools and the techniques from psychotherapy can help people get through this. So how do we get through it? tough times where the purpose is to not enter the symptoms, not listen to them, because there's nothing in them. They're, they're false in that sense. They're there and they feel right, right obviously, but there's nothing in them. It's, it's, it, it's brain chemistry adjusting that's causing the symptoms. And one thing that I've learned, and to say this is also, if we have to give a talk on how to help people not worry or ruminate or circle around in thoughts, say, what if thoughts, and if just that, and why, and all these ruminations that we could get caught in. This is the same technique. So sometimes, actually, I succeed in treating withdrawal, managing that, and how to manage negative thoughts, because it's the same technique. Okay. Just as well use the symptoms for something while they're there. <laughs> so symptoms are under attentional control. And there's a concept in psychology from what is called metacognitive therapy. I don't think it's so big over here. It's from a psychology professor called Adrian Wells in Britain. And there's a concept called detached mindfulness, which is defined as a state of awareness of inner events without responding to them. And not responding to them is to be understood as a very broad category. It's a fancy way of saying to leave something alone. It means not evaluating, not attempting to control it, not suppress it, not respond to it behaviorally, nothing. And you know this concept, you're detached mindful all the time, you just don't know it, you're not aware of it. Hopefully, um, you haven't, I don't know, I'm gonna try, you haven't paid much attention, hopefully, if this has been interesting, to the sound of this projector, I think. You hear the sound? Did you pay attention to it before I said it? You might, <laughs> but most people don't. You also don't pay attention to the way it feels that you sit on these chairs right now. It's there, now you feel it. You don't pay attention to that very characteristic, um, excited, feeling that's in the mouth all the time. Now you feel it. So there's actually quite a lot of noise around us that we know perfectly well how to filter out if we're focusing on something. That's to leave something alone. Now, obviously, the difference is that these are completely irrelevant, neutral stimuli. Of course, you're not paying attention to them very much. But it shows you that we know how to do it. We know how to leave something alone. The only difference is that withdrawal symptoms, obviously, are, as our negative thoughts, are unpleasant, meaning they will pull in our attention. They will make noise. But it's the exact, exact same mechanism. We can learn how to be in that, just as we can learn how to be in negative thoughts or all sorts of unpleasant bodily sensations without responding to them. Obviously, that's not something we should do if it's like a primary emotion, if it's something we, we should need to listen to, obviously not. But because withdrawal symptoms are by definition irrelevant, they may present as very, very important and they may look exactly like a depression or anxiety. There's nothing in it. Therefore, it makes sense to apply these. Things. And we can train that. It's, um, it's, think of it as a muscle, really, that we can train. We call it attention training. Mindfulness and meditation does train this too. But in this um, therapeutic school, we would call it attention training. So there are ways to, to, to train your attention. There's some very funny exercises. So we could do another workshop on that sometime in ICA, maybe. These very, because they take more time than I have now. But just know that this is a skill. It's an ability, something you can get better at, and it's very, very crucial 
way to get through withdrawal symptoms. Because withdrawal symptoms, as these neutral sounds and stimuli, also tend to step in the background when you do something. Now you may, have, you may feel the inclination, tendency, urge to do less when you're in withdrawal. Like protect yourself more from the world and do less and stabilize and relax and all these well-meaning things that just, if they take over, end up to not work. Because then what do you have? withdrawal symptoms and a lot of time to pay attention to it and a lot of time to overthink and also the thoughts may present themselves as very very important it is our fundamental urge to rid ourselves of discomfort and distress that ends up playing against us because you fight against something that you cannot you lose meaning acceptance and allowing and detached mindfulness is a way through it. And when you learn, obviously this only works with a correct taper, like there's no way to just leave, leave severe withdrawal symptoms alone, obviously, I should add. This has to be combined with proper tapering to minimize the withdrawal symptoms to a level where you'll be able to be with them and do stuff anyway. It's really important, sounds so basic, to have something to do while in withdrawal and discover this switch from inner focus our attention has like two overall settings. It can be inwards towards symptoms and feelings and energy levels and motivation and bodily sensations, everything inside, or it can be outwards. It's very basic. We just don't, we just don't tend to think of it that way because attention has become such a normal world. But attention is also like, it's a psychological uh, term. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a gatekeeper of awareness, you would say. So of all the things that there are here, both out here and in here, what enters awareness? It's a pretty cool thing to have under control. <laughs> Otherwise, we're slaves to whatever happens inside, and that's going to be really tough. And then discover that we can actually make that switch from inner focus to outer focus. It's completely within our control. We just need to discover it and learn how to, to do it more, facilitate it. And then withdrawal symptoms that are enough minimized by a proper tapering will tend to step in the background. Not because they're not there. It's not distraction. Distraction is trying to, to, to be louder than something else. Distraction is trying to replace. Here the symptoms can be there, they can call, they can do whatever they want, they can do their thing, but choosing to have a focus in that noise. And actually the way we train this attentional training, it is literally just a sound file, sound file 12 minutes, with a hell of a lot of a noise. And then it's um, Adrian Wells, the kind British voice, and you sit with eyes closed, navigating you through, um, paying attention to the different sounds. You're getting better at that. Obviously the metaphor is that the noise, sorry, the mind is noisy. So if we can learn to do it on actual sounds, that kind of spills over to our own thoughts and feelings and withdrawal symptoms and whatnot. So that's the link between doing the exercise with a lot of noises. So it's not distraction. It's better than distraction. It's voluntary and active um, attentional control. I hope that makes sense. How much time do I got? Plenty of time for questions too. It's a broad question to ask out of a big crowd, but does it make sense? Does it, does it ring any bell? Yeah. And Adrian Wells is very strict in his saying, and I didn't understand this at, fir this at first, that it's not something we need to learn to control our attention. It's something that we need to discover that we can already do and then apply it to unpleasant, negative things. It's a good way of thinking about it, because, and that's why I'd always use the neutral stimuli, clearly. Now you can maybe feel it again. The noise, feeling in the mouth, sitting here. Just the idea that we actually know how to do is we just need to train it when something is, in the lack of a better word, pulling in our attention. It's trying to require it. It's trying to acquire it. Obviously, because the body thinks something's wrong when you reduce the dose. It likes stability. 
that's the, base, the premise of homeostasis. The body really wants us to do the same thing over and over again. It doesn't like change. It knows how to change. It's not a dead end. The receptors will rebuild if you do it slowly enough, but it takes time. So the body will think, and certainly those of you who have tried to be in withdrawal will have felt that it feels exactly like something's wrong. And maybe it's just something, like anything that's wrong, like having an annoyed, irritated nervous system that tries to attach onto this and that. This is the explanation. The next hour it can be that. The next day it could be this X, Y, Z. That's the mechanism we're trying to go for, to, to see that. And as easy as it sounds, I know, leave that alone. That might continue to pull in you. And, and you've done plenty of things in your lives without motivation, without wanting to actually. You've done plenty of things where there were other things that in this here and now were more desirable. Only in the long term it wasn't, so you chose to do the tough thing. It's the exact same mechanism, it's the same skill that we try to build on here. And it does something because it may sound complicated to leave something alone, and that's why we have the exercises to show that. Um, but this knowing that we are already aware, know how to do it can sometimes help. So we need to be cleverer, more clever than our body. Our bodies will think something's wrong and it has the control of all the signals so it can send you all the anxiety and the low mood and uh, the excessive thoughts. That's within your body's control. Your control is what you're going to do about it and how you're going to, and if you're going to do anything about it, what happens. And I like to think about that, that that's the, that's the way we can communicate. That goes for withdrawal, for anxiety, for example, is a very, very strong emotional response too. And there's no way of telling. Good luck arguing with that. Good luck arguing with your negative thoughts. You may have tried it with positive and realistic and compassionate thoughts. That kind of adds to the problem now, doesn't it? Because you, you keep the symptoms alive. You keep the conversation with your own mind alive. That can go on for a long time. And that ends up being worrying or rumination. So I like to think of it in a way that the most powerful way we can communicate to ourselves, our bodies, if we are in the situation that we know is not dangerous, it's just the transition, the step from one dose to another. It's not more than that, but your body will think it is. The best way to communicate to your body is, tough as it may be, to act as if you know that it's not dangerous. That's the best way you can communicate as a very powerful tool for anxiety too, actually. If you're ever in a situation where you know it's safe, at least some part of you knows it's safe, but your body will send all sorts of completely irrelevant signals that it's dangerous and that you should get out of there. The way we can communicate is exactly via this method. Okay, let's talk more about that at some specific maybe event for that at some point. Laura is nodding, good. Last slide, and this is a big slide to end with, obviously, but it's, I just want to say it, like this, this question of when have I fully stabilized after coming off is a very, very tricky question to answer. But one thing's for sure, we know definitely what it's not. So, and that can be kind of translated into what are we returning to, which is a bad word because you're not returning to anything. Life has passed during, so don't think you have to go back to how it was for all sorts of obvious reasons. I know what it means and we want to get back, but things have changed since then also. So think of it in a way that what are we waking up to? Which is then an even bigger question, what's normal? <laughs> well, that's a big slide to end with. But I bring this because I see many people, understandably, um, because they've been through psychiatry and the medical model, that our ideas of normal has been, can be have come completely disrupted obviously, because that's what the medical model does, right? It's an effect of that. I can tell you what it's not. There's something called the default mode network, and it's not something I call it like. Uh, for 10, 15 years, there were about five or seven scientific papers with default net mode network in the headline. Now it's over a thousand, it's exploded. And it's just, it's even in the name, it's what the human brain does when we don't interfere with it. The exact definition is, <clears throat> it's the brain state when demands for focused attention are low. So when we don't, when we don't do anything, 
you easily enter your default mode network. You could just start doing nothing and see what happens inside. The brain will have a tendency to do five very specific things. And I should warn you, none of them are very positive, and that's the whole point. That's a very, very strict limit as to how happy, how high the mood can go in a, when we're in our heads, as opposed to being out in the world. So the brain does five things. One thing it does, it focuses on things that can go wrong. And it focuses on things that did go wrong. And it focuses on what other people think of us. And it focuses on problems and conflicts. It's very negative oriented. And it focuses on things we must and should, especially the should. Now, that's not a very negative, fun, pleasant, calm place to be, and that's the whole point. It's built for survival. We have a few years when we're kids, children, before this bloody thing takes over, where we, <laughs> where we have life outside of this. And I think many, many humans have very, it may not be conscious, but we have very, very many attempts to go back to that, or just to feel the gist of it. But it takes over, it's part of the survival. And for survival, it has to be obviously negatively oriented. It wouldn't make any sense if our minds were positive by default. People who had that died. They're not, their genes are not here anymore. So we're all left with a mind, obviously, um, depending on what happens to us in our upbringing and what we encounter and what does and does not happen. Point is, this is not a very happy place to be. And what other people think of us is a huge thing, obviously, or potentially, because it has huge, it had huge survival, function of survival back then. It still has, but to a much higher degree back then. That's why we're so focused. And it's actual, like social threats are just as much deathly threat as a genuine deathly threat for us, like not being accepted, not being part of a community, not being part of a group being ridiculed. It all it can start the exact same anxiety symptoms as a lion can because our body cannot tell the difference. And if our if our if we get to the idea that we are only allowed to be here if we're perfect, then you have the straight line from perfectionism, which is a big thing today, down to survival. That's where we're at today for some people. The conclusions, and it's exactly 5.05 now, sorry, 11.05, my watch is in Danish. <laughs> I'm six years ahead. This is not a negative message. I should stress that. The purpose of showing is, is not this is what awaits you, it's going to be really tough, it's going to be negatively oriented. That's if we're in our heads. The human mind is not a very pleasant place to be long term. Obviously we need to go in there. We need to it's not all just bad, but we need to have control over when we go into it. And our mind will have a tendency to pull ourselves into this when it's not helpful. When we want to sleep, for example, or be where we are. Do what we're doing. So generally that's why we want to get out of our heads and into our lives. If it's unpleasant to be in our lives, something's wrong that we need to pay attention to. That's another talk, but just having that is the idea. And don't wait around. That's, it refers to this question, right? Don't wait around for this to turn positive. Like, automatic positive thoughts are rare for most people. Some might be blessed with a positive default mode network. Most of us are not. So don't wait around for this to stabilize. That's not what stabilization means. It requires doing something. And now coming off the drug may give you the, depending on what effect the drug had, may give you the ability to feel deep connection and positive emotion, but it, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. And that can trick some people. And obviously this is not people's own fault, like psychiatry, the way that works, we've been used, we've been taught to talk to thinking about the symptoms. Many of the symptoms in the DSM and ICD-10, as we use in Europe, 
are this. So they succeeded in calling that a, an illness. And of course, this is a horrible place to be. It's not to say that that's just how it is, live with it. Like a, a, a negatively oriented human mind creating excessive thoughts and the feelings that the body follow can be the worst place ever to be, especially if you're traumatized, because the body will scan for threats. It's set in standard mode for scanning for threats. So silence can actually be the worst. Like outer silence can be the worst state if you're traumatized. So, but there are ways around that. There are ways to get out of that. Um, don't wait around for it to turn happy. But know that there is a way to come out of it. It really basically, in just one sentence, and I know that is unfair because it's more difficult than that in practice, we can learn how to not listen to it. We can learn how to not engage in the conversation with it. Half of the excessive thoughts, or even more, are our own. We make it a conversation. We answer it. And we may answer it with all sorts of positive, mindful, realistic thoughts, which appear good, but can end up being just a part of the problem, especially with withdrawal symptoms. I hope I've been helpful. That was my talk. To anyone watching ri live stream, they should refresh their, their link, link the comments, the to enable the comments. Refresh the browser link. Cool. So, yeah, I guess it's question time now. For how long? About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes? Good. Hey, I can see you. And then we'll the live stream yep. Okay. I almost can't see who has a hand up. Can can. Yeah. So the question was like, what, what, do I have to repeat? Could you hear it? I'll try to summarize it. So the idea is that you came off the drug too fast a long time ago, yes, then Lexapro. Lexapro, then reinstated and tapered correctly. But still to this day, you're, you're nervous. You, you have reactions to things you didn't usually. Yes. And you mentioned what examples, antibiotics? Antibiotics, uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D, okay. Yeah. So something that usually did not, you, you had no problem taking it now, even after coming off. Right. Yes, exactly. I don't know the, there's very little literature of it. I, much of what I've been talking about here today is controversial. It's not in the literature. So, so obviously to get to, to, to answer that question scientifically is a long way, sadly. But like in a, in a more general sense, the, the, the phenomenon of, of, of kindling, you would say like, it's obviously it's because we have one nervous system and the psychiatric drugs enters the whole nervous system. We may call the drug selective and all sort of, sort of nonsense, but obviously it affects the whole body. And I think you should, you should ju just take it as, as, as a disturbed, destabilized nervous system still. Like that, it makes sense too. Like coming off too fast is a huge shock for the nervous system. In, in, in some sense, it's built for it, and in some sense, it's not, because it's built to repair it, it knows how, but not in those degrees, like in amounts. So it has a huge shock, meaning that an, an a, good, a, a smart, adaptive response to shock is to get sensitive, also for us. 
the nerves. And that in the survival, in, in, sorry, in the purposes of, of survival too, I would say, that has to be, it, it generalizes to other things. So we also see this for sometimes, uh, it can go down to shampoos, certain chemicals, uh, other drugs, alcohol, coffee, all sorts of things. And I think that's because it's the same thing now. The, and, and expands to other things than the drugs specifically, because it's one nervous system that got shocked. That, oh God, this is not supposed to happen. I better do something for this not to happen again. I better get over sensitive to it. I think that's the, at least when thinking about the nervous system in that way, it kind of makes sense that that happens. And if you're, it, it may not be permanent, it can have a very, very long, long effect of feeling. Yeah, I hope that made sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so it goes quicker now, like the periods are shorter. Yeah, so it is healing. It just takes long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course. That gentleman, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, Anders. Before yep. we start, I just want to restate the question yes. because to make sure our live stream audience is also hearing it. Yes. So the question, sir, was um, repeat it for me. Sorry. Well, <laughs> well. If the, if the receptors are right. Right. Why? Why? In other words, why are manufacturers only manufacturing them in doses that are not really useful for withdrawal, given everything Anders has just yeah. shared? Not only not useful for withdrawal, but for the treatment per se. Like, why do we? Why do we use so high doses? Yeah. And I think you got it wrong when you said it, it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Like, I ask myself that question too. I found no, absolutely no, good answers to that question. Like, I think it's really primitive. Um, if something doesn't work, let's try with more and see if that works. Like that's 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 a way of thinking that you would use in many other problem-solving areas. And I think it's just that. But it it has it it has no scientific merit at all to do that. And it's even worse than that because this we can show that it has no additional effect of going up that plateau. But it's worse than that because we have a lot of of um, trials comparing different doses, and they come in two forms, and I can explain them in 30 seconds. One is fixed dose trials, so you'd get 50 milligram, you'd get 100 or 200, and then we'll, we'll, we'll check the effect after so and so many months, and there's no difference between that. We have very clear data on that. There are many systematic reviews. People on 100 would not feel better than on, on 50, and we also have so-called dose escalation trials, where all of you got the same dose, and then after so and so many weeks or months, the people who did not respond got a higher dose to see if that would bring them to the to the effect. And those also show that it does not work. Actually, it shows their own conclusion. These are not my words. The most effective dose is the least effective dose. If you increase it up. Because side effects tend to, because God knows what this drug starts doing once it's not on the primary receptor, it starts spreading throughout the body, doing all sorts of things that cause side effects, which is the definition of a side effect. So, and that's why really sometimes, and please don't, don't that's why I said it's an average, don't just go home and see the graphs and say, okay, I'm at that dose, I can reduce down to that dose because that's where it bends because it's, it's individual. But if you're on a very high dose, there's no need to taper five to 10% at the beginning. In fact, most people can, most people, I can't say that, I have no statistics. Many people, some people can actually reduce and then get better because at that point there are no withdrawal symptoms, but there are less side effects from reducing the dose. And then you can kind of get, okay, I'm one of those who do not get, I'm not prone to withdrawal symptoms, let's just continue, and then it hits. And that's pretty, so don't get caught up in not having withdrawal symptoms in the beginning, because. But the answer to your question, I'm babbling and on, there is no explanation. It doesn't make any sense <laughs> to up the dose. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So these are, this is a question from online, from our live stream viewers. 
Um, here's a great question. Uh, see if you can come up with a short answer for this one. On this. How do you not pay attention or filter out pain? How do you not pay attention or filter out pain? Depends on what you mean with filter out. I would, it's a tricky question to, first of all, it's difficult to explain. That's something we have various um, experiential, would be the English word, exercises for. Think of it as something you can learn. It's a skill. But think of it more like not filtering it out or avoiding it. Think of it more like acting, like doing stuff while the pain is there if that makes any sense. Don't have the goal, because if your goal is, even if your goal is for it to step in the background or, or go away, you're kind of always kind of checking if it's still there, and then it's there. Then you're back into threat monitoring, right? Then you're back to inner focus. So if you could, in one sentence, it would be swap, change your goal. Your goal is not to filter it out. Your goal is nothing. Everything can be there, but the goal is to act like do, in that pain, that's a different thing. And then when we get good at that, the pain tends to, obviously, um, depending on what kind of pain it is, tends to step in the background. And sometimes it's just a little, and sometimes it's just a little, some of the time, but it's worth going for. And there is a huge literature on how to use mindfulness, for example, on chronic pain. Um, so it, it's, it's a thing, it's a field, how we can do that. I hope that made sense. I think that makes that, great that sense. Is, um, how about one more question mm -hmm. from online? Then we're going to take a coffee break downstairs. We have some nice coffee and some um, really unhealthy sweets <laughs> for you all. Um, and then we'll we'll come back up. And, and after, we're going to clear the theater at 1 o'clock, um, but we'll be able to go downstairs and take a few more questions with Anders at that time, too. Um, so last question from our YouTube audience. Um, this I love. Do you have any ideas on how to have discussions with providers that are stuck in the, the quote-unquote medical model? Um, how to have discussions about this knowledge base of what you're talking about here? Um, because some people don't have the ability to no. find providers who understand this. No. There's not a whole oh, lot no. of people out there. No, that's kind of that's kind of where ICI and the whole idea comes in. Like, but that's a very unfair answer to just say that. Obviously, <laughs> because if it's really stuck, oh God, what do we do? If if, if the doctor's really or the professional's really stuck, I think there is a point where you have to. Oh, I hate saying that, but give up on that. It's really amazed me how many feelings there are from, not all, that's a generalization, but sometimes for doctors and psychiatrists when their field is attacked, and I can't recognize that from my field, like criticize away psychology, criticize it, I do that myself too. There's not the same kind of like emotional necessarily reaction to that. For psychiatrists there can be, and especially if it comes from a patient, like there's a huge, huge power gap there. So I would say you're up against something very difficult there, but <coughs> the more you can refer to it with hopefully data like this, science, like something in their language. I managed to do my PhD over five years. It usually takes three. I managed to take five years on it because I really wanted to do it thoroughly. And part of the reason for that was I wanted to learn their language. So it wasn't like a humanistic psychologist talking about emotions and stuff like that against the medical language because it kind of tends to win and it'll do that in that situation too. So try to have the discussion, which is an unfair ask, I know, because a lot of this is very technical, but have something to refer to then so that you don't have to be the one explaining it because that's very, very unfair. Have something to point to the papers and we could easily figure out some way of creating a database on like in this situation and with that, these are the key papers because it has some kind of, of, it will be their language and it will be in fancy academic journals that they will have a respect for. So I think that's the best way to take that load off your own shoulders. That's excellent. Thank that you so tough. much, Anders, yep. for, for all of this. We are, um, let's give Anders a round of applause. <laughs>
My name's Claire Leveson, and I am the Director of Development for ICI, which again makes it sound quite a, a grand and big organisation, which uh, it will be very soon. Um, it's such an honour to be able to introduce our Founder and Executive Director, Laura Delano, who is a personal hero of mine, and, or heroine of mine, and someone who I know has just brought so much to so many people around the world. Um, so for those of you who don't know Laura, she spent her adolescence and young adulthood as a psychiatric patient, and um, since she herself came off five psychiatric drugs in 2010, has worked extensively uh, within and beyond the mental health system um, in various different capacities. Um, she's supported hundreds of people through the psychi psychiatric drug withdrawal process and connected with thousands of more um, across the world with, with similar experiences, as well as obviously building a home in ICI for, for those people, for, for me and for, for you and for all of us to be able to connect with each other. Um, I think, yeah, for me, when I, when I came across Laura's story, it was the, the real light bulb moment for me. Um, and if I hadn't come across it, and if she hadn't have been so brave to share it and put ICI out into the world, then I may well, very well, still be in the throes of um, a very, very harmful and um, painful existence that I had for a decade whilst I was a psychiatric patient myself. And when I, when I found Laura's story, um, it really gave me, and through connecting with people in ICI and building friendships and, and having the support of other people who have been there and who, who get it, um, I've really been able to build my life um, beyond like my wildest dreams of, of what I had felt was, was possible for me. Um, I, uh, you know, I have a family now and I have a career and, and skills which I'm so excited to be able to bring to ICI in service of this really critical vision that we, we all share and that we all in our hearts know is just so, so important for the world to have access to and, and f for the change um, that we that we need to actually kind of come into being, and, and that's what we're here to do. So, um, without further ado, uh, thank you, Laura, for everything you've done to get us to this point, and for everything that you're continuing to do to to really build a better a better world for all of us. Um, and thank you to everyone uh, for being part of that as well. Um, and here's here's Laura. I already started to get teary. I, I cry. I cry like every time I speak publicly, and and for me it, it feels like activism. You know, just to show this is what it is to be alive. We emote. <laughs> it isn't a pathology. Um, so, so yeah. So so thank you so much for being here. Um, um, one of the things that that uh, when when Anders and I first connected, we realized each of us had kind of co come to some of the same um, uh, realizations, discoveries, learnings, just coming from, he, him, with Anders coming from the, the clinical kind of professional research world and me coming from my own personal experience, just figuring it out for myself, not reading or learning any kind of formal methodology, but just bumbling along and figuring it out for myself. Um, and that to me is what the art of coming off these drugs is all about. It's about us as, as patients um, you know, on this quest to free ourselves. Um, we're basically faced with this blank canvas in front of us, this void, this massive mound of clay, whatever analogy you want to use, um, because there it, we are in the dark ages of this, this, uh, this work of coming off these drugs, and so we basically create our own um, we, 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 we figure it out by doing it, by experimenting, by being curious, by making mistakes, figuring out how to do things differently. We come to our own, our own truths, our own discoveries. We make art out of our suffering. Um, and, so, and, then, and then we take it and we turn it into resources for other people. And that's, to, you know, as, as Claire and Cooper have talked about, the importance of community, of each of us sharing our stories. Because my story isn't special. I, I'm really blessed that I got to have it shared in, on a, you know, Bob Whitaker's website in the New Yorker, but 
I'm no different than, than all of my fellows <laughs> in this work. Um, and, and each of us has so much art to make out of, out of, our, out of our suffering. Um, so that's really what I, I'm going to be talking about today. And, and what do I really mean by art? So the, the dictionary definition is <laughs> the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination. And, and holy hell, it takes imagination to survive withdrawal. <laughs> and, and, um, and I love thinking about, about our journeys in this way because um, it's, we're, not, you know, polar op we're not in a polar opposite role to, to the science. They're not, science isn't our enemy per se. We operate in these different realms that c can complement each other. And as Anders said, it, are, it's, it's so important to have a, a scientific understanding to, to get the biochemical logic behind slow tapering. Um, but as you'll, as you'll hear and, and when I share my story, I didn't know any of that. I didn't have the science. Um, I, I figured it out really only in the aftermath of doing it the wrong way, you could say. Um, and, and for me and for, for ICI, what, what we are really about is helping to kind of blow up this whole idea that expertise comes from getting a graduate degree and years of training, fellowships, the number of letters after your name, um, at least when it comes to, to engaging with psychopharmaceutical drugs, um, I think the greatest experts are those of us who've actually taken them and fought to get off of them. Um, the, the layperson wisdom of, of our experiences to me is, is what, um, what I think uh, is the most important and trustworthy information out there. So before I get in, um, into all of that, just a quick, very quick backstory as to why I even found myself on drugs wanting to get off them in the first place. So I, I met the mental health system as a 13-year-old. I was having a profound crisis of self. I was very driven in school, robotically performed well in academics and sports, and basically had a breakdown where I realized I don't have a self. I'm not a, who am I really? I'm just programmed. My, my worried parents understandably took me to a therapist. I was too serious for the therapist. I was cutting myself and talking about killing myself and all that. The therapist sent me to a psychiatrist. Within an hour, I was diagnosed bipolar. The rest is history. I was 14 by the time I got that diagnosis and took my first psychiatric drugs. I fought it through high school. Luckily, I didn't take the drugs regula regularly. But by the time I got to college as an 18-year-old, I was still kind of playing the performance game and, and aware of that, feeling so trapped in this life that didn't feel authentic. It didn't feel real. I didn't know how to get out of it. Just hoping, hoping, hoping once I get to this good Ivy League school I've worked so hard to get to, I'll, I'll prove myself wrong and I'll finally be happy. And of course I wasn't. And it was at that point that my pain had grown just so profound and I was convinced that I had exhausted every option at my disposal to, to fix it. Um, so th that was what led me um, back into the arms of, uh, of the mental health system. And very quickly at that point, because I was so desperate for an answer and for relief, I embraced my diagnosis. I embraced this idea that I, I was sick and that was why I was suffering, that this sickness was an incurable medical condition, that this textbook through which my doctors diagnosed me was, was a valid scientific text and that because I had this medical condition, I would need to, need to take, I would need medical treatment for the rest of my life. Um, and I, I embraced it and I s really stepped into that role of a good compliant patient over the next decade, as you all know from your own firsthand experience, my life fell apart. I got progressively physically sicker. I gained, my, my weight fluctuated 70 pounds. I had chronic pain. I had chronic headaches. I had skin issues. I, my, hair and my hair was falling out. I was just sick all the time. My emotions just continued to get more and more um, uh, just, just beyond my, my capacity to, to coexist with. Um, my mind, I couldn't remember, I couldn't think clearly. I had racing paranoid thoughts all the time. And all along, of course, my parents and I were believing in this idea of my illness getting worse and worse, treatment-resistant mental illness. Um, and eventually, I reached the point at which killing myself became the only logical solution to this unbearable life. So 
that brings me to that, that happened in, in uh, 2008, so a long time ago now, and, and two years after that, um, 13 years ago now, I was 27, um, going to day treatment at this place, McLean Hospital, that was my home. I really had come to see it as my home because I'd spent so many of my formative years there. I was living with my aunt and uncle, unable to, to work, to take care of myself. A big accomplishment for me was taking a shower and not like binge eating a, a box of stale Dunkin' Donuts at the end of day treatment. I was a mess. Um, I was completely dependent. I had been born into a family that could provide for me materially in, in all these ways, and so I was really lucky. But um, I, I had no the, the thought of ever being an independent, functioning, autonomous adult in the world was just not on the cards for me, as, uh, or how I, or so I, I thought. Um, I was also in the middle of coming off five drugs um, because I had found Robert Whitaker's Anatomy of an Epidemic. I had clicked with the fact that the long-term use of these drugs had harmed me, and that's a, that's a different story than today, so I won't get into that, but I knew um, that I had to, to give myself a chance at coming off of them to see if maybe somehow my life could look different. Um, and so because I was aware of these harms, I was convinced the faster I get this toxic shit out of my body, the faster I'm going to heal and figure out who I actually am. I had no idea that I had it backwards. I didn't know anything that Anders just shared about. I had no one. I didn't know about the withdrawal forums. I had no grasp of anything. Um, and so I came off five drugs in about six, mo six months, um, thinking that was slow. <laughs> um, and this is what it looked like. <laughs> Um, this is what my, the landscape of my brain and body felt like. Um, it is unspeakable, t the experience of coming off these drugs too fast. Uh, it really, truly, you can't put words to it. Um, f for me, you know, all of the existing problems I had that I listed out of, you know, the years of long-term use magnified in intensity. Um, the paranoid thoughts, just unable to, to ever feel still, to ever have peace, it was, it was intolerable. Um, boils, acne, migraines, like you name it, cognitive issues, I was, I was a total mess. And what I lacked in that first year of coming off and, and being off was, as I said, I had no I information about anything that I was going through. I had no measurable evidence that anything was getting better. Um, and even though I had a, I had a sense of w why I was doing this, because I, I, was, I wanted to find out who I would be off these drugs, I had no like, orientation, no momentum. I didn't know where I was going. I truly felt like I was just being buffeted around in a stormy sea. What I had in turn, though, was a lot. I think. I think my, my long history with pain, with mental pain, emotional pain, physical pain, just from long-term psychiatric drug use, and of course all the pain I was feeling prior to getting psychiatrized, I, I was so comfortable with it and familiar with it that I think that really served me when, when the pain went off the charts in withdrawal. I actually think the fact that I didn't know anything about withdrawal ended up serving me. I had, I was ignorant in, and, and the, the, you know, the whole ignorance is bliss thing. I, I look back now because I didn't have a story that I was telling myself about what was happening to me. And so while on the one hand, as Anders said, and I, I do believe it's important to have a kind of biochemical context for what is happening inside your body, um, I, I hadn't, because I hadn't spent time in the the wild, wild west of the online withdrawal world. I hadn't read all the horror stories. I hadn't read, I, I didn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't creating a prophecy for myself. I just had no idea what the fuck I was, was happening. Um, I was blessed to have the unconditional support of my family, my aunt and uncle with whom I was living. Um, even though my, my immediate family was, of course, worried, uh, they, they hung in there with me. Um, as I said earlier, because of the class I was born into, because a lot of this comes down to class, 
I was insulated from a lot of stress, a lot of responsibility, um, a lot of material struggle that so many of my friends in withdrawal have to face. Um, I also had space and time because I wasn't working, because I, my only job was to go to the psych hospital every day. Um, I, I see now I just had this kind of expanse of, of yeah, of, <laughs> of, uh, of, of time and, and, and space to just bumble along. Um, and at the time I was really active in the 12 step world because I had quit drinking. That's a different story. And so even though I didn't understand withdrawal, I didn't know, I, I was kind of thinking, maybe this is early sobriety from alcohol. It didn't really matter the why, as Andre said. I just the fact that I had a space where I could go every day, hear other people talk about getting through their pain, being, being, with, being with it, surviving it, transforming their lives, that was such a gift to me. Um, and, and again, I had this, I was so fired up after reading Anatomy of an Epidemic and, you know, having blown up that old story of, oh, this, you have treatment resistant illness and this is why you want to kill yourself. This is all that's in store for you. I had no idea what else my life could look like, but just the fact that it was possible um, was such, I look back and I see it was such a gift. So one of the things I love to do that we all get to do with this art we make of our experiences is to, to turn it into information that I can share with others. So I've made a list here of some practical tips for, for, for anyone out there who hasn't yet started to taper, but you could also apply this if you're in the middle of a taper too, because you can always pause, step back, um, utilize these same, these same things. So, so here's a list. So first, discard the notion that you need to find a prescriber or a clinic or a telehealth clinic to help you taper properly because you don't. And in fact, sorry to be provocative, a lot of us have found that the most dangerous place you can turn for good help when it comes to getting off these drugs is a doctor, is a clinic, is the medical mental health system. Um, a lot of people expend so much time and energy on this quest to find the right doctor who knows, you know, who's going to help me taper properly. I can't do it yet because my, my, I don't have the... The great news is much of the time you can just set that quest aside, save that energy that you otherwise would have been expending on that. Those of us in the layperson withdrawal community, we have all created everything you need to know to do this, to prepare yourself, to, do, to taper off. Yes, you need an actual prescriber writing your prescriptions, but they don't even necessarily need to know you're doing this. Obviously, everyone's situation is different and there are lots of factors to consider, but this idea that you need a uh, licensed expert, pure mythology. Um, take the time to educate yourself well in advance of making any changes in dose. I, I often say, and we say this at, at the Withdrawal Project, that the, the taper journey s doesn't start with the actual reduction. It starts with preparation. Um, and basically l learning everything that Anders just talked about and taking the time to really understand like what's going to be happening in your body, what you can do to help mitigate the changes. It's only going to serve you. And it might feel daunting and overwhelming because a lot of this information is dense to, to basically teach yourself pharmacology. Um, it's, it's, it can be really intimidating. And for many of us on these drugs, myself included, it can, you know, the cognitive impairments, and temporary injuries that these drugs cause can make it really hard to learn. So that's, if you're in that situation, finding someone, whether it's a fellow, if, and like an ex-patient, um, or s a family member, a friend who can help carry the load, the, the mental load of, of learning all of this will serve you. Uh, get clear on what's in control, in your control, and what isn't. Um, and then plan accordingly, because there are factors that you can control. M most of the time, the speed at which you're tapering, what you're putting in your body, like nutrition-wise, you know, products, whatever else. Um, sometimes there are certain stressors or responsibilities you can control, like maybe don't take that big trip or maybe don't make this big change or, you know, obviously a lot you can't, but that's where the, 
finding the discretion between knowing what is in your control and what isn't can help you just kind of, you can take whatever steps you can take and then let go of the rest. Um, you know, other examples like who you're actually looking to for help, the expectations you're putting on those people in your life to help you. Um, the more energy you, you can invest up front into, into really kind of like getting clear for yourself, like where, where, where do I have the power to, to, to optimize my circumstances and where am I going to need to really like let go, accept, just allow. Um, it can help make the experience a lot less uh, overwhelming once you're, once you're in it. This, like, I, I, I feel like we should just have this plastered everywhere all over the place because, you know, and, and of course you, we've seen recent, a recent new study published, everyone's saying, oh, tapering slowly is X, Y, Z. Oh, I tried to taper slowly and it didn't work. Or we did a study and we tapered people slowly and it didn't work. Slow is so much slower for many, 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 many people than you even think possible. As Anders said, the fact that some people when they're on, the, the, you know, when you're at that really sharp drop in the hyperbolic curve of receptor occupancy, um, for some people, getting, getting through those dramatic changes really takes a long time. And, and it's, I, I, like when I share that with people, I can, I can see just the despair overtake them. And I'm, and I'm like, no, it's, it's actually great news. This is a good thing because it, there's this speed paradox. The, the faster, you are going to get off the fastest and stay off. It isn't just stopping the drug. You want to be able to stay off of it too. You want to be able to not have to reinstate. Um, the fastest way to do it is to do it slowly. Uh, and, and this is where, as Anders touched on, and as I'll, I'll talk more about too, this is where your body, the messages it's sending you come into play because that is really how you're going to decide, determine what, what is um, slow enough for you. So taking every step within reach to optimize your body's capacities. Our bodies are amazing. What, we, what I have reversed from getting off pharmaceuticals, not just psych drugs, the pill, the whole, that's a whole other story. I used to have auto, autoimmune thyroid disease. I had IBS. I had all this shit going on in my body. Holy moly. And I now look back and I see, when I think about how much my body has, has figured itself out, resolved itself, um, and how much that has been facilitated by me getting informed about uh, about what kinds of choices I want to make about what I'm putting in my body and what isn't. It's just like I'm an endless optimist about just how plastic and resilient, reversible, so many of the injuries our bodies, uh, our bodies face are, especially when it comes to pharmaceutical injury. So that's, you know, whether it's nutrition, finding a kind of movement exercise that you can tolerate just it sounds cheesy it sounds like woo woo wellness i'm not saying it i'm saying this in a very practical way lowering inflammation in your body um removing as many psychoactive substances as possible that can disrupt the the this quest your body is on to find homeostasis because it isn't just your brain it's your gut it's everything that is seeking homeostasis the more you can do that, the better you're positioning yourself. Know your why and pursue it courageously. We call it the withdrawal beacon at the Withdrawal Project. Um, and it's for me, my, that why that I had all the way at the beginning was like, who the fuck could I be off these drugs? I need to find out. And if it ends up that it's horrible, I can kill myself. I always have that. But I needed to find that out. Um, and I never lost touch with that why no matter how I have the chills talking about it, no matter how out of my mind I felt, no matter how out of place in this world I felt, I just, every day, was like, I have to find out who I am. I have to find out who I could be, what my personality is like, what I care about, what my values are, what my body, my actual uninterfered with body is. And so if you don't have a clear why, whether you haven't yet started or you're in the middle of it, I, I highly encourage you to, to pause and really get clear for yourself. It can be anything. You want to have a baby. You don't like how your personality has changed. You haven't been sleeping well. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a big, profound why, but just know it clearly and stay connected to it. 
throw out the calendar and embrace the mystery. As Anders said, <laughs> there is a truth that, that that receptor occupancy curve is true. Fact. Not up for debate. Not as, oh, it's someone's opinion. No, this is, that's biological reality. But where, what your particular, you know, biochemical makeup is and, and vulnerabilities and sensitivities, everyone is different. There is no way to know how long it's going to take for you. You could be one of the ones who can do it on the faster side. You might be one of the ones who needs a long time. Just let go of that idea of it needs to be done by, by New Year's because there's so much disappointment that, that when, when you attach to needing a, needing a specific outcome, needing a set timeline, you invest so much emotion in that. And I think it's safe to say likely it's not going to happen. So just embracing the mystery and, and, and like turning it almost into like a meditation and like being with the unknown. I don't know how long this is going to take and it's okay. And I don't even need to think about the future because the future doesn't exist. It's a fantasy. Right now is all that matters. It sounds so cliche, but it's true. So back to my story. Um, <laughs> this is the aftermath of a rapid taper. A um, lot of decimation there. And, and I, I really like the kind of like bomb fire analogy. This is from a wildfire, this picture that I found. But I, I, it truly does feel like that's what happens inside of you. Just you're gone. It, destroy, it feels like at this profound existential level, like you're destroyed. Who you are has been destroyed. It makes me cry just thinking about it. It feels that way. But, you know, as we all know, new growth comes after we need wildfires. The nature needs to be burned to grow new life. And, and so for me in that first year, really first two years off, my, I was really, really, really struggling. The, all the physical issues, the GI stuff, chronic constipation, for, then diarrhea, chronic migraines, the, like had a really hard time going into the grocery store because just the lights, the stimulation, being convinced everyone was talking about me and how disgusting I was, blah, 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 all the noise of thought in my head. Um, but at the same time, little things, not little, big things were starting to shift. My sexuality came back online. I had never had an, an orgasm in my life. I had never had sexual function as an adult makes me cry because it's so profound what gets taken from us. Um, when it came back online, it freaked me out so much because I had never felt it. These, I had that facet of my being. I'd never been online before, so I had to learn that who I was at that level. And I'm really lucky that I came back because for some people, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go as far as to say it's permanent, as some people say, but it can take a really long time for some people. Um, I had a few moments to where I was like walking around outside in the winter and I'd like be like, whoa, I'm real. I exist. Holy shit. Like my fingers, I, I was like I was on psychedelics, like, whoa, I'm here. But overall, it was hard. Now, th <laughs> this is me around two years off. I like <laughs> scoured my phone and my computer to find pictures of me. I, I, when, I have so few pictures of me during this because I was so ashamed. I felt so trapped in this body that didn't feel like mine. But I managed to take this selfie with my dog, Mr. Tumnus, rest in peace. Um, it's obviously blurry. Um, that's my baby blanket that I like grew up with and slept with in bed. And this, I'm in my parents' house, and I, I probably spent like five hours before watching TV because um, I still was retreating from the world a lot. I was living on my own by this time, but um, but I was still not fully integrated. Um, I was still struggling, still had a lot of physical stuff going on. There had been lots of positive shifts with my, and, and how I was existing with my emotions, things were, I was less paranoid, like positive shifts were happening, but I felt like a newborn in life. Like I didn't, it felt like I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. In spite of all that though, by this time, this would have been 2012, 
I was writing a blog. I was sharing my story. Bob Whitaker gave me this amazing gift of, of a platform and the, and the editorial guidance to, to start telling my story. Um, I was starting to speak at conferences. I had been going to conferences basically with, I was starting to go to them within months of, of being off because I had f realized over these two years that I was a part of something much bigger, that my story, what I had gone through is what we were all going through together. And so I had thrown myself into this world of educating myself, meeting people, getting out there. And here, even though here I am snuggling with my baby blankets and my dog, because this was like all I could handle doing. I'm sure in my mind in this very moment, I was like, I can't handle doing anything else right now but being on this couch. Maybe a week before that, I was speaking at a conference. So I was, I was living. Um, perhaps most importantly, through writing my blog, I was hearing from people who were reaching out for help, for support, and I was realizing what I've been through has value. This, this wasn't wasted years. <laughs> this wasn't fruitless, pointless, wasted existence. I actually went through something really meaningful that could help someone else. And boy, oh boy, having that every day was so critical for me. Um, so this mouse, Anders, your mouse, I haven't touched a PC in like 15, <laughs> Years like I don't even know how this mouse works. Um, no, no, I'm trying to look at a note. It's okay. Um, so, oh, so I look back at that kind of two-year mark, and I'm like, I was a fucking artist, and I didn't realize it. Like all of us here, we are artists. I, I still didn't realize how resourceful I was being, how hard I was working, figuring out how to be, how to feel. Like I, I, I still felt like a deer in headlights basically every day, but when I look back in retrospect, I'm just, I was testing things out. I was experimenting. I was exploring. I was courageous. And all of us are. All of us are. If, you, if you're sitting there and you're like, I'm not, it's not me. I'm not, I, this is not true. Yes. All of us are so courageous for just bumbling along in this unknown terror of post-psych drug life. So again, um, I love taking my own experiences of what I did do or what I didn't do and turning it into something that might help someone else. So as I have snot running down my nose, <laughs> um, so here are a few, a few of them. Keep it simple. We are trained in consumer society just as we're bombarded with ads everywhere for this and that and oh, this new product, do, 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 like just constant information overload of all the things that we need that will help make us better, that will optimize this, that will do that, 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 that. When I look back, I see it was when I started to take things away, to simplify, to reduce, to extricate myself from, from thinking I needed to go find some, some supplement or some healing modality even, even, even the, the, the more holistic ones. The more I let go of that, um, the more I just let myself, my body have some peace. I, I see now, I think that, that was what it was calling out for. As, as Anders said, that, like, the basic organizing principle of the human body is homeostasis. And the more stimuli, stuff, interference, disruption that's just getting thrown in there, like, oh, I want to try a touch of this supplement because my sleep is a little off and then maybe this or that. When I think about what's happening inside, you know, that, that bomb blowing up, that, that, sim, that like kind of metaphor of what, what is happening in our inner landscape, just every new thing is like a new disruption. You know, so even like, yeah, just psychoactive substances, processed sugar, all those kinds of things. Be strategic. Um, it's really hard to do this when you're in acute, intense pain, but orienting yourself around, uh, like in line with the long-term stability that you are going to get to as you make your decisions in the here and now, it is such a useful skill to develop. This, this makes me think of like how, I, I remember reading years ago how 
I'm not sure which ind indigenous tribes in what part of North America, probably all of them, every decision that they made was thinking like two or three generations ahead. How will, how will this, what we're doing right now, affect three generations from now? And I mean, we all should be living that way in, on this planet, and we're not. But when it, it, that's another conversation. Um, when it comes to the decisions you're making in the here and now of your withdrawal experience, keeping that in mind, that when you're feeling that impulse to, you know, take that over-the-counter sleep aid, whatever it might be, that in the short term might help, help, you know, it might bring you some relief, it might soothe you in some way, but what is that going to mean for your central nervous system six months out, 12 months out? Sometimes these decisions that you make, these strategic decisions you make are around like maintaining relationships in your life, um, the kind of support system you're engaging with, how you're, you know, the thing, what you're sharing with them, what you're not sharing. Maybe you're someone who has a history of being forcibly drugged, forcibly locked up, um, making decisions in the here and now that will help insulate you from that. It's such an important practice. Um, and, and once you get good at it, and once you realize how much that so m you're in the driver's seat so much more than you realize, th than you think you are. Um, it gets easier and easier to make decisions in this way. Quick fixes lead to long problems. I don't need to say any more. <laughs> Time is what your body needs most to heal itself. I've covered this. Um, it really is. It's so, so, so tantalizing to think like if I just find that right specialist who can give me that right thing to speed this up or to fix this withdrawal symptom. or the, It's so tantalizing. I get it. Time. And it isn't, I used to say time heals you. No, your body heals itself. Time is what your body needs to do that. Make space to hear your body's messages. Learn to decipher what they mean and listen accordingly. Sometimes, you know, th these drugs disconnect us from ourselves, from our physicality, from our spirits, from every, every facet of who we are. And the art of living in the aftermath of taking them is the art of coming back into our bodies, understanding what the hell they're telling, what the hell this thing is, this flesh thing I'm in is telling me. Like when I eat this and I feel this way, what does that mean? When I sit in front of a screen five hours a day and straight and I feel like I'm going to punch someone in the face, like that's a message I need to listen to. And I know for me, all of my psychiatrized years, I was living every day completely out of touch with what my body was screaming out to me or was suppressed and blocked from being able to scream out to me. The art of living post-drug is to reconnect with your physicality and with the, all the languages that it speaks to you so that you know when sometimes action is needed, like maybe you do need to make a change in your life, sometimes you just need to feel the pain and, and be with it. I have a sofa here because about three years off, I really started to connect with how political this whole thing is and how rooted in consumer neoliberal <laughs> ideology this whole thing is, that we truly are trained to be afraid of ourselves and to think we need to buy and consume and obtain shit that's going to fix us. And it's a scam. <laughs> I'm, it's, I realized, and I say that in this fiery language because that's where I was at three years in. I was so fired up about how bought into all of this I had been that I would just sit there on my sofa and I would be like, my mind would be just telling me the most like dark, dystopic shit, and my body, I would be feeling so uncomfortable, aches, like digestive stuff, and I would just sit there and feel it, and just sit and feel it, and it hurt so much, and I would just feel it and with this like defiance, you know, it's so political, and it's so radical to just do that, and we have the power, each of us has that power, and it's the antithesis of what the mental health industry teaches us about ourselves channel your grief and anger into acts of connection and creation. It can be so toxic to go inwards, like Anders was saying, when you go in and you're just fixated on what's happening inside of me, write a f poem. Go like m punch a pillow, m mount, punch a mound of clay, 
send an email pouring out your pain to someone who you know can receive it, start a blog, <laughs> write a song, whatever you're called to, channel your pain, channel all the understandable grief and anger into creation, construction, not into the very thing that, that the system wants, which is not like self-destruction, which will then lead, lead you back to that system. And don't wait until you heal to start living. So many people, Anders touched on this, so many people will sit in their house and say, I can't do anything until I feel better. Insist on getting outside. Insist on feeling the sun on your face. Insist on talking to that stranger in front of you in the grocery line and just having that moment of human connection, no matter how much you're hurting. Okay, so we're at 30 past. Okay, I'm going to move through this, and then we're going to get to some questions. So this is me, again, with the dogs. I've, these are the only pictures I seem to have let myself be, be taken with. Um, this is me around three years off. Um, I was fully alive at this point and still struggling. I was writing. I was connected to so many people. I was in the first healthy relationship I'd ever had in my life. I was working in the mental health system as an advocate, connected to others. I started a support group in Boston where I lived for withdrawal. I was living and I was struggling so much too. And, and, and like that's, that's, that's what it's all about. I was insisting on living. And, and I didn't even realize I was doing this at the time. Um, oopsie. Anders, this damn mouse. Um, so, around this time, three years off, this was really hitting me, that, that getting off these drugs is just the beginning. It's really not even about getting off the drugs. It's, that's, the real work begins in the wake of all that. It's, a, this is, it's at that point that we discover who we are, what we care about, how to communicate, how to connect. Speaking for myself, you know, I had never been able to be an adult. <laughs> I had been drugged through my entire 20s, so I had to figure out how to be an adult in the world, and it was terrifying. I got really, the more I educated myself about how the power of a diagnostic label, you know, the, the power it has to just create an identity prison that you put yourself in, that you get put in, but then once you buy into it, you keep yourself in. Um, I, I realized it isn't just letting go of those old stories that are bullshit. It's also practicing the art <laughs> of not needing a new story to replace it. Just sitting in the unknown, lack of definition, lack of clarity, lack of explanation, not needing to answer. Like Andre said, you're always, you know, it's, it's, we can get so programmed, just why is this happening? What does this mean? What's an explanation? Just sitting with this blank slate. Um, and not needing to write anything on it. It's the mystery of being alive. Um, and this was a big one for me. Again, I think it really is rooted in consumerism, much deeper than the mental health industry. But of course, this is like the very concept of mental health. Like, why the hell do we all think the objective here is to be happy? <laughs> like, I don't, I wouldn't, I'm at the, you couldn't, Pay me a million dollars to be happy all the time. So, I was about to say boring. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's just so, uh, un yeah, life is just so, so rich and, and complex. And this idea that, that until you feel happy, until you feel peace of mind, like you're not there yet, something's still off in you that you need to tweak and alter and fix. That was a profound shift for me because for so many of us in the withdrawal journey, we're wanting relief. We're wanting the withdrawal to go away. Got to get out of this. I got to stop this struggle. When you realize, like, I can be in this struggle, that's the true freedom. That's, is, the freedom isn't from the drugs, the, the pharmaceuticals in your body. The freedom is realizing these drugs are in my past now and I don't need to go find another solution because that's an illusion that's going to keep me just 
like keep me from myself, from what it is to be fully alive. It, get, it, it hurts to live. It hurts to be alive. I cry all the time. Cooper can attest to better than anyone that I have a lot of anger, and it comes out often, <laughs> especially when I'm sleep deprived, which I've been for years now because I have a fucking kid. I'm a, I'm a mother. <laughs> like, I never would have thought that that was possible 13 years ago. Boy, oh boy. Um, but the more you practice just being in the pain, it's the the less afraid you feel of it it just it just happens and you don't need to like it, it makes me think of what Andre just was saying you know that you don't need to learn there's not some like skill out there that somebody you need to go sign up for this course it's going to teach you how to be you just do it you just be with yourself no matter what's happening in the space between your ears because boy <laughs> What's happening in this space is crazy. <laughs> I, if I told you the thoughts that go through my head, if I like narrated them to you, you'd be like, wow, <laughs> whoa. And I just, as, as time, as these 13 years have unfolded and I'm like still very much in this process, but I've just slowly, and I have, I go back too. It's not like a linear progression, but I, I'm getting better and better at, at listening past it because it is noise like Anders said it's noise it's it's hallucination this is real this my feet on the ground like us with each other like what's in our heads right now is not real it's it's what is behind that what's deeper than that um you know I I did in my patient career my psych patient career I did a lot of CBT and like challenge those thoughts and like oh you're like one guy this psychiatrist first name Igor used to say picture your thoughts are like the bozo on the bus you're on a bus together and your thoughts are this bozo and you say bozo I'm not gonna listen to just the most infantilizing patronizing shit that I fucking sat through for so many years like okay okay Igor that thought you're bad thought I'm not gonna listen to you like just just let it all like the noise there's just this track in my head all the time and I just sometimes I listen to it but I always know like it's 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 not real and in withdrawal this skill as Anders talked about and this is what I love like we're basically saying the same thing I have no idea who Adrian Wells is <laughs> you know um, and I love that that like we as lay people figure this shit out for ourselves um, all we have is right here, right now, this space. When we all go downstairs in however many minutes and like look at each other in the face, hug each other, cry, that's reality. This is not reality. You are powerful enough to be with yourself. I don't care what you're telling yourself. I don't care who has told you otherwise. We each are so powerful and we have the power to stay with ourselves, especially when it hurts the most. Life is so hard <laughs> it takes having faith in for me like it's funny I'm gonna wrap up in a in a minute am I good yeah um I, when I was just talking with my friend David Cohen who, who came into town he's an awesome guy google him if you haven't read his work um he's a professor at UCLA and I was telling him about like my evolution out of how I got basically from where I was as a mental patient in 2010 to now and I was saying you know so I got I woke up to the bullshit of the DSM and the drugs and all that. And then I kind of like got really active in the 12 step world. And that was my home for a while. Um, and it was like, I was little miss AA. I worked the steps. I sponsored women. I was like speaking at meetings and AA is a lifesaver for many people. It isn't right for everyone. I ended up leaving it many years ago, but I eventually realized like I've just stepped out of one powerful institution that's basically telling me to like turn myself over to this higher power of psychiatry and now I'm doing it in this other place and like yes a spiritual disease is much arguably less damaging to think of oneself as having than a medical disease like like so-called bipolar but I was still turning my authority over to this higher power what I ended up realizing is like that power is in me and not in some like I am God 
like I am, it, as human beings, we each have this inner authority, this inner compass that is there all the time. It's not about like going out and figuring out how to trust in yourself. It's about like stripping away all the layers that are blocking you from it, healing the wounds that have interfered with your connection to it. It's in us right now, each of us. You have this power. We all do. So with that, I'll wrap up here, and, and I think we have uh, maybe 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for questions, and then we'll wrap up. Cooper will wrap us up, and then we can all go hug and cry downstairs <laughs> and be with each other. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I think maybe the best way to do this is um, if we're going to take questions from the audience, I'll just try and repeat what you said, or Laura, you can. That's probably most efficient. Um, but does anybody here have a question for Laura? That's a great question, and thank you so much for making the trip here. Um, your role as a family member, and I know there are other family members in this room, and I hope every, you all find each other downstairs. Um, you are in such a difficult role in this because, of course, every situation is different. Sometimes family members reach out to me because their, their adult child wants to take the drugs, believes in the diagnoses, and the, the, the parent has realized, holy shit, what did we do? Why did we ever send our kid? Because uh, often they were kids when they got sent. And that's a whole, there's a whole kind of, strategy isn't the right word, but there's a whole approach to take if it's in that situation. If, if, if it's a situation where, where the, the, your family, the, the person on the drugs wants to come off, wants or is, is really curious about this kind of life. I think family members, the number one thing is educate yourself, which it sounds like you're already doing. To, the more informed you are, the more understanding you have of everything that Honors talked about, the history of the DSM, and this just how non-scientific that, that textbook is, um, understanding just the, how deep the, the corruption goes in terms of the regulatory bodies in the US and every other country basically having this revolving door relationship with drug industry. So the, so the more informed you are, the, I, f I find that family members will, that's what helps them feel really anchored and rooted and clear in their own orientation, um, which, which helps, can help a family member sink deeper than the fear. Because of course, like my parents were terrified for many, many years. I mean, when I was on drugs, they were terrified I was going to kill myself, especially because I tried to, and so it was very, that fear was so real for them. In withdrawal, it took them a long time. Um, but the more informed you are, I think also, at the end of the day, like I have said to parents before, like, how, how do I convince my kid to come off these drugs? And I say, you, that's not, that's not going to be a helpful way to think about it. This as patients, we lose our autonomy, we lose our agency, we lose our sense of being in the driver's seat of our lives, and I truly believe that to get off these drugs, we have to step into that. And so family members, it's about holding space. Um, if, if, if your loved one isn't there yet, it's about holding space for them, 
in subtle ways, maybe leaving a copy of Anatomy of an Epidemic on a table, whatever it might be, where you aren't kind of imposing your very well-intentioned, very like factually accurate understanding of the situation without imposing that on them, because it can end up backfiring. And then I think perhaps even most importantly that you as family members get support too. In the exchange here, Intercompass Exchange, that's the link to join. We have a family circle um, with where family members are, are meeting every month, they're supporting each other, because supporters need support too. You are in this big journey, and it's inevitably going to be complicated, scary, confusing, um, and I think taking care of yourself, like this cheesy, you know, put your life, mat, whatever, in the airplane thing, it, it, is, it is true. Um, and, uh, and I think like r really also being clear about your own boundaries and needs. I've, I've worked with and connected with many families who really struggled to have boundaries. And so the system became unsustainable. Someone ends up getting locked up involuntarily. A couple ends up separating. Like the more you can all as a family system have like a really kind of, in it, when you're all in a, in a rooted enough place to kind of step back and be like, how do we make the system work here? What are each of our needs? What are our boundaries? And how can we all kind of create a shared understanding so that we don't, we don't fuck the system up and it's sustainable? I think that's also really important too. I could keep going, but let's talk more downstairs. <laughs> Any other questions here? Yes. It's a really good question. And that, to just like make it a little bit about us for a moment, we, this is what we are shifting. We're not, I shouldn't say shifting. This is what we are expanding our focus on. So the question is basically who and what out there is actually trying to reach people before they get sucked into mental patienthood. I, and I use that very provocative language on purpose because that's how I, that's what I was. Um, we, that's a big part of, as an organization, as we, as we try to build our, our funding base, grow our team, grow our capacities, we don't want to just reach downstream anymore because 99.7% probably of the people who've contacted me over the last 13 years are downstream. They've already been harmed or their loved one has already been harmed. They've woken up and they're like, holy shit, what do I do? We obviously are going to continue to, to and expand what, how we, we support that, those everyone in that situation, but you're totally right that so much of what in the critical psych, critical mental health, psych survivor, whatever labels you want to use, landscape, a lot of the focus and does end up being on talking about the problems of the mental health industry and helping people mitigate the harms that they've already experienced. So I think a lot of it is going to come down to storytelling and a big part of what we're going to be expanding into over the next year and beyond is how do we help raise up our stories, get them into the, the mainstream, all over social media, all over TikTok especially, because it's Gen Z, and is there, I don't know if there's a new one yet beyond it, but... Alpha. Alpha. Like, that is who, we all obviously need to help us older folks as well, but the future is these young people, and the entire culture of TikTok and all that is like, it's cool to be mentally ill. It's, it's, this is how you are understood and validated in your pain. You need a list of labels. The more meds you're on, the more proud you can feel of your pain. And, and to me, what's at the heart of this is that our society has lost its way. We're disconnected from our neighbors, from our bodies, from ourselves. We're sucked into screens all day. Like, the suffering that these young people are experiencing is very real and needs to be listened to. And the fact that, that my, my like old 40-year-old person analysis is like they, they are in so much pain, their life feels meaningless. Society feels fucked. We're destroying our, our world. What's the point? At least we can all be really mentally ill together and like talk about how fucked up we are all the time. And, 
and it's like you're suffering, you are canaries in the cold mine, and your suffering is real, and, and the most, the, the most, the best way to validate that suffering is to actually talk about it as a response to society and what's happening out there. You're not actually validating your suffering by pathologizing yourself. Like, it, it's, your suffering is political, and so that's going to be a lot of what we're shifting into doing more of, helping all of our community members tell their stories in really accessible, like, viral ways online so that it, we get to a point where that 16-year-old girl who's getting, going into that psychiatrist's office for the first time, in the very least, has this seed of, of an idea in her mind, like, a lot of people say this is, has actually harmed, like, so it, that becomes a part of the, the consciousness of our, of our culture. But there isn't that much happening right now. And what is, a lot of what is happening right now is still kind of within the mental health industry. Like, drugs are bad, but my amazing therapeutic modality is great, so come be my patient for the next 10 years. Like, what we're about, I'm not, I'm not anti that. Let me be clear. I'm sorry, I'm speaking a little flippantly, but what we're about is helping all of us realize we don't need any professional services, any system. We have each other in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. So... It's an important question, and we all need to be grappling with it together. Because, like, I think the literal um, survival of our race, of our human species, is at stake here. And it's only we're only going to heal our world if we actually start listening to our suffering and not pathologizing it. Um, just get some questions from the online people, and then we can continue our group downstairs. Um, some people seem to get withdrawal symptoms at a delay. How can they account for that if listening to their body doesn't warn them soon enough? Um, that's a good question. I would say um, like we have like a, a little catchphrase thing we say at the withdrawal project. Start low, go slow, see how it goes. And I think what can help mitigate against it, so just so any, in case anyone isn't familiar with this, some people will make a cut and dose and they feel fine for a month, for two months, sometimes for three months, and then suddenly, bam, they're walloped with this like crazy experience, whatever it is, and they're like, how is it, this can't be withdrawal, I made the cut months back, and we don't understand, maybe Anders downstairs can, can will have a better understanding of kind of like biochemically why that happens because I don't know but I think the best way to address that is to start out with a small enough cut giving yourself enough of a stretch of time to like really see how your body handles it so that you you can kind of like never have to get in get in that situation to begin with and you just slowly I think the way to think about it is, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is a universal rule, there are always exceptions, but any kind of surge of in, intense enough symptoms that you can't function in your life, like it, that's, a, that's a sign of going, of going too fast. So if you can ideally never go too fast to begin with, to set off, whether it's immediate or delayed, that's the, the better. So, so starting with a small cut and gradually building up the percentage over a long period of time until you reach the point where you actually feel the onset of something. Um, chances are, if, if, if you do it that way, whatever you have the onset of will be manageable enough that you can be like, whoa, whoa, okay, I found the kind of the sweet spot of how I'm tapering. I'm not going to push beyond this, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's a great question. So, so someone's asking about updosing, which is basically what you make a cut, you experience withdrawal symptoms, so you go back up to your previous dose. So there's no hard, like again, because there's so little research into this, this is all what people have kind of figured out for themselves. Generally speaking, if, if, if someone makes a cut and it ends up being too big and you feel new symptoms, Going back up to the previous dose at which you last felt relatively stable within two weeks, a lot of people find is a pretty safe strategy. After two weeks, 
and even sometimes before two weeks. But after that, it's a little more hit and miss. If, if, if you cut too much, going back up might work, it might not. I remember a friend, I won't say her name, but I haven't, gosh, I haven't seen her a long time. I wonder how she's doing. She updosed like six months out and it resolved her, her struggles. But on just a note of warning, I also know people who's, whose withdrawal has been way further destabilized by updosing too. So it's like the sooner you go back to the previous dose where you felt stable, the better is kind of the general philosophy, but there's no hard and fast rule. And again, it's like ideally you, you make cuts that are small enough where that uptick in symptoms is never big enough where you have to do that in the first place. Let's do one more um, question from online. Um, I think you'll be able to answer this briefly. I, I, I get your message. Okay. And I'll then, be Thanks, honey. And then I have, <laughs> I have one last note while we're still up here, so just kick it back to me, and then we'll all go downstairs and continue this conversation. Um, this is per Mental Health Rebels, whoever that is, they're awesome in our comments here. Do I wonder about, I do wonder about permanent damage, and permanent is in bunny ears. Can brains always heal? There's some really crazy, sad, and rough stories out there. Hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I, I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to think I could know. When it comes to psych drug injury, though, um, I am like a, a fearless optimist. It might take a... If, if you've been on these drugs for decades and you come off them too fast, it, it could be a long road back. But this idea of, like, I, I think my experience has highlighted so clearly for me what a self-fulfilling prophecy the stories we tell ourselves about who we are can, can be. And so to say to oneself, I have permanent damage, the future hasn't happened yet. You, how do you know? Um, you know, I don't know enough about neurology and, and, and brain injuries. Like more, I, I have really no, no understanding beyond anything related to psych drugs. Like maybe there are permanent, you know, of course there are things, you know, people live for the rest of their lives in vegetative states. That's a separate thing. When it comes to psych drugs, I, I am a fierce optimist. Sometimes quickly, sometimes very, 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 very slowly. But if, if the basic organizing principle of the human body is homeostasis, why would that rule like except for in this situation like i call me naively optimistic but i i think it's 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 always possible to heal that being said i still have sensitivities i'm 13 years off and i'm i'm i can't smell perfume like i get sensitive with like certain candles like there's smells that give me migraines like digestive issues if i eat certain foods but i'm like if that's my permanent injury like so be it. Like it forces me to be really aware of what I'm putting in my body. Um, maybe we stay sensitive indefinitely, yeah. But I don't know if that's a bad thing. But when it comes to in, you know, debilitating injuries, I'm a fierce optimist about it. Thank you, Laura. Thanks.